The Money Mystery, Chapter 3, Misleading Propaganda Dear Chris, Throughout most of the 1980s, officials praised the economic recovery. Ecstatic that the 1982 recession had ended, they boasted about their astute handling of economic policy. In 1983 and 84, many employers assumed these official pronouncements about the recovery were true and they began expanding. Your dad was one of them. He invested heavily in a new office building, computers, and hired more workers. Employers bet heavily that the recovery was real. The superstar of high-tech, Apple Computer, launched its new Macintosh line of personal computers. But sales of the new Miracle PC did not achieve expectations, and in June 1985, Apple announced the closing of three of its six plants and layoffs of 1,200 workers. Its stock fell to $14.62 from a January high of $30. This at a time when the so-called recovery was roaring. By the end of the decade, the truth about the recovery was widely known. The Reagan-era boom had not been nationwide. It had been confined to certain areas, notably the stock market and the two coasts. Much between the two coasts was still hurting. Why was it confined to the stock market and the coasts? It has something to do with a process economists call the injection effect. It's too complex to explain in this set of letters, but I promise I'll cover it in a future set. Our subject for now is the little-known forces of velocity and the demand for money. To continue, Houston and Denver were in depressions. U.S. car sales remained below the levels of the early 1970s. The banking system was a mess. The rescue of the savings and loan would cost more than $100 billion. The oil industry was still distressed. Farmers were nowhere near as well off as they had been in the previous decade. The 1987 crash had decimated Wall Street's financial firms. Perhaps the most important but least publicized story was the growing hardship of the young. The real, inflation-adjusted, average income of families headed by persons under age 30, which included your parents, had plunged 14%. Persons over 40 were doing wonderfully, but poverty among the under 30 generation had doubled. The American economy had been severely damaged at the start of the decade before Mr. Reagan came to power and by the end of the decade, it was still damaged. There had been no real recovery. What happened? We cannot be sure. Economics is not an exact science, but studies show the velocity of circulation of the dollar had become erratic and gone into decline. Each time the Federal Reserve injected money into the economy to spark a recovery, the injection was offset by a fall in velocity. A repeat of the experience of the 1930s Great Depression. Velocity is the speed at which dollars change hands. It is a measure of the demand for money, which is the willingness of people to hold dollars. When velocity is high, people are trading their dollars away quickly, which means the demand for dollars is low. When velocity is low, People are trading their dollars slowly, which means the demand for dollars is high. Velocity was in a stable rising trend for 35 years after World War II. The financial panic of 1980 broke this trend, and velocity has remained unstable ever since. This has left federal officials with a major problem. How do they know what the supply of dollars should be when they do not know what the demand for dollars will be? The news media reported almost none of this because so few Americans knew enough economics to understand. In fact, I doubt many reporters or editors understood. Most still don't. But the Federal Reserve's economists discussed it incessantly in the Fed's publications. For a small sample of this discussion, read Money and Velocity in the 1980s, Solving the 1980s Velocity Puzzle, Money demand, some long-run property, monetarism, and the M1 target. 
These are complex scholarly articles written for economists, but if you want to get into the subject deeply, you might try them. Unfortunately, I don't know of anything about velocity and money demand that's written on a level most people could understand. That is where I write you these letters. You can see from the chart that after World War II, velocity went into a stable uptrend for 35 years. Let's look at the chart here. This stability ended in 1980, and as far as we know, has never returned. Clearly, something dramatic happened to velocity and the demand for money in the U.S. To understand it, we need to learn a bit more about velocity and the financial panic of 1980. Then we will look at the great crash of 1987 and the meaning of all this for our future. Uncle Eric I think it would be very interesting if Uncle Eric updated these letters to include what has happened here in the 21st century. But until then, we'll read chapter four next time. Thanks so much for listening in. Love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.